I want to welcome you all very much this morning to this uh, Capital Markets Day at Medistim. Uh, my name is Kari Krokstad, I'm the CEO here. And um, before actually going into agenda, I would just like to say thank you to my many colleagues who have helped in preparing for this meeting today. There's always a lot to organize, so thank you very much. Okay, exciting day ahead. And um, as normal, I will start with giving you all an update to the company. And um, I've uh, made, a, I would say, a bit of, of a frisky subtitle here, talking about the hidden gem with a sparkling future. So, well, that's how I see it. Uh, we'll see whether you will agree to that later on. But uh, it's really not me you should uh, come to, to listen to today. It is our two guests. So we have the big pleasure, and I'm very excited, very proud to being able to welcome and introduce Professors John Puskas from New York and also Pirkavit Katma from Helsinki. So these are really the experts in the fields of cardiac surgery, vascular surgery, and you know all the questions that you may have uh, with regard to what we are doing in this business, well, maybe they can shed some light on that as well. Uh, we will move on to a presentation uh, from our um, leaders of R&D and also product innovation. And they will shed some light about how Medistim is, is thinking about product development and technology development going forward. And then hopefully there will be both time and some uh, interest from you guys to uh, ask some questions. And hopefully we'll have a little bit of a dialogue towards the end. So with that, I will uh, get right into uh, giving you the introduction of Medistim. I know that many of you are acquainted with the company, but not everybody. So what we are, a global niche market leader within ultrasound technology. And to give you sort of the, the snapshot of the company today, we are uh, a company, medical device, we are developing ultrasound-based technologies. We are uh, concentrating around two modalities of ultrasound, one quantitative uh, method for measuring the amount of blood flowing through a vessel, and also high-frequency ultrasound imaging, and the combination of these two. Uh, the technologies are used in cardiac, vascular and transplant surgery to reduce risk and enhance quality. And this is what our surgeons will shed some personal experience and, and light on. We have uh, been around for almost four deca decades so far, so uh, quite some time. Um, still not too many employees, a bit uh, about 130. Our headquarters are here in Oslo. We have a production facility in Horten. Uh, and, um, we have a large sales organization. Uh, we are um, represented through direct sales forces in the United States, in the UK, Germany, Spain, Denmark, and Norway. And as you might have noticed yesterday, we announced that we are from now also going direct in Canada. And uh, this is part of our strategy, and we're very excited about uh, this new addition to our direct uh, sales uh, channel. Uh, we already have a strong position in Canada, just to mention that. We have been represented through a good uh, distributor, Medtronic, for several years. And uh, we already are uh, represented in um, 15 out of 38 uh, cardiac centers in Canada. So it's a good starting point, but we believe that we, from now on, can actually um, develop this market further with our own salespeople in, on the ground. Uh, in addition to this, we have a global uh, distributor network, which has been represented by Medistim for years, uh, and are present then in all the major markets in the world. Uh, there will not be too much clinical uh, information from me. I just want to uh, emphasize that uh, our technology has been extensively uh, well covered and also endorsed by clinical guidelines. There's more than 500 clinical papers out there talking about the use of flow technology and also ultrasound imaging for cardiac and vascular use. So it's a very, very solid foundation and support for the clinical value of using this technology. I uh, also want to mention that in the early days, Medistim was a distributor of uh, uh, various products in the Norwegian market. And we still have uh, a portfolio of products uh, as part of the company, uh, but it's becoming gradually a smaller part. And uh, based on the last year's numbers, we see that about 15% of our revenues and 9% of the EBIT is coming from this third-party portfolio. But uh, let's go back to our own products and talk about the medical need um, and a little bit background for what we are doing. So 
we are helping surgeons address issues within cardiovascular disease. And we have the experts here, which will really give you more details here. But just as a reminder, this is the background for, for what we are doing. And uh, based on the information from the World Health Organization, uh, it's still a fact that this is the leading cause of death globally, uh, still. And very often the problem here that we are trying to address is caused by blockages that's preventing blood from reaching out to the vital org organs in the body. Um, disease examples, coronary heart disease, cerebrovascular disease, peripheral art artery disease, and the application areas for medicines technology, coronary bypass surgery, carotid and arterectomy, peripheral bypass surgery, these are some examples of the target applications that we are addressing. Um, and then there is a fact that for the majority of these patients that are in need of any type of revascularization, for the most part, they will receive an endovascular uh, alternative, both for the cardiac surgery and also in the vascular space. So the big question, I guess, is that when, for instance, in a coronary bypass surgery, more than 80% of these patients today are getting a stent, does this mean that we are moving towards 90% or 100%. So is this open surgery going away uh, in the near future? We don't believe it will, uh, but we will learn more from our surgeons to tell us why there will still be a need for these type of surgical procedures for uh, uh, the, the most diseased patients. Um, and when these patients are going through the more invasive uh, open surgical procedures, of course, it's very, very important that it's worthwhile going through this. And we believe that uh, when the surgeon has done the very, uh, very challenging work of, um, of um, making these grafts, it's very important that they're using um, objective technology to really measure that you know, this has been successful, that the grafts are open, well-functioning, they can close the patients and, and rely on a good result. Uh, so, in the middle of this uh, slide, we can see a medicine probe being connected to uh, a graft, and inside that probe head, uh, there are ultrasound transducers that are being, well, submitting ultrasound uh, beams. It's uh, traveling through the, the lumen of this artery, being reflected, and we're measuring the time it takes for these beams to travel both in the direction of the blood flow and in the opposite direction. And this time difference is then proportional to the amount of blood flowing through. So, that's the simple uh, background for the technology. And um, typically what the surgeons will see when they're looking at the ultrasound devices, uh, well, to the left here we see a, a, an open chest and an exposed heart, and we see the medicine probe being connected to the graft. And if everything is fine, what the surgeon will see on the screen looks something like this uh, um, graph in the middle, where we see a very smooth flow curve, we see good flow and indications of low resistance. So, all good. To the right, on the contrary, we have an example of suboptimal uh, graft. We see a more spiky curve, we see less flow, we see more indications of resistance. And then the question is, is it worthwhile to go back and correct this? Uh, in this uh, case, the surgeon decides to revise the proximal anastomosis and we can see the results that is appearing, so a much better situation. And uh, clearly there was a technical error here that was fixable. Uh, but sometimes the results are not as clear-cut and it's a bit more difficult to know is it worthwhile to go back and, and fix this. So, uh, back in the days, medicine felt, well, what if we could actually develop a an imaging probe that is uh, making excellent pictures in the near field. So take a look inside of this uh, arteries or anastomosis and take a look inside whether there is a technical issue that can be corrected. That was the idea behind adding high frequency ultrasound to our device. And um, the idea was then if the flow measurement data suggests something is not optimal, take a look inside, see whether there is something you can uh, detect um, uh, um, a stitch that has been uh, placed wrong, a dissection that has been made, uh, or something that you can actually uh, redo. With this uh, probe, we are also introducing a new tool, um, and this is providing value all through the operation. So we can start using it for the, for the cabbage surgery, start looking at the aorta, making sure there's no soft plaque, no um, 
uh, risk of, of stroke. Uh, you can use the probe, the same probe, to check the conduits and also the coronary targets to find exactly where this blockage is located. So it, all of a sudden we have an expanded value proposition, not only technology to check whether things are okay, it's actually guiding the surgeon during the whole procedure. I am very pleased to see that this topic of uh, whether to use uh, these type of technologies to uh, elevate the quality of the surgery is still a very current topic. And we can see uh, from the very recent years, expert consensus statements being published. And I was, I was really, really want to point to this um, uh, publication from Circulation, uh, where 19 uh, uh, expert surgeons come together, taking a look at all the published literature available out there, and uh, coming out with 10 consensus statements, where the first one is that TTFM should be used on every cabbage patient. So this is, I think, is a, is a great example of uh, a community that is really dedicated to continue to, uh, to pursue improvements within this space, uh, and it's just wonderful to see. Uh, when it comes to the adoption of our technology, it varies widely, but for sure we are moving towards uh, a situation where uh, uh, TTFM has become standard of care. And uh, in particular in Japan, uh, today we would say that more than 90% of these procedures are supported with flow technology. And the same, uh, almost the same level is true for the Central Europe, Germany, Austria, uh, Switzerland, Spain, the Nordic countries. Uh, is all uh, in the same situation where this is standard of care. Um, we see that other countries are also on the move, uh, pointing to the United States, which has been a number one target market for medicine for many years already. Uh, we're seeing that today more than 30% of these 200,000 procedures is uh, supported with our technology. Um, and this is really proving that adoption is picking up all around the world. So with a recent uh, establishment in Canada, I've also um, uh, added that, that country to this map, and we can see that we have more than 30% of the current uh, number of procedures. So good start. Um, but interestingly, I'm still talking about uh, coronary bypass surgery. Um, it is a fact that um, not everybody is using a technology. And actually still 55% of the number of procedures performed globally. There is no use of technology. So surgeons are palpating, they're feeling for a pulse uh, on these arteries and uh, using that as an indication for a well-functioning raft. So uh, clearly there is a lot uh, more to be done and a lot of growth opportunities still for the company. Um, I've used uh, cabbage surgery now as the example, uh, but clearly uh, our technology is also valid for surgical guidance and quality assessment in vascular surgery as well. And it's in particular these indication areas where we are concentrating, uh, peripheral bypass, carotid uh, antarterectomy, and also AV access. Um, and um, we see already that there is uh, good adoption and a lot of uh, routine use actually on these technologies in certain parts of the world. So in the Nordic countries, and the Professor Vikatma here representing Finland is one of the leading countries um, with use of these technologies. So it's going to be exciting to, to see whether we will be able to really um, uh, develop these this, uh, application areas in other markets as well. Because um, based on these uh, applications and the, the size from some of the most key markets, we are adding more than 900,000 additional procedures as targets for uh, the company. And uh, also another 1.5 billion NOx in uh, annual um, uh, sales opportunity. So of course, this is uh, a very interesting space for us to go after. Quick look at the products, just to remind us what we're talking about. Uh, this is the Miracu, the latest generation, first launched in 2014. Takes a little bit of time until you have regulatory approvals in every country. Um, and the most important thing with this uh, generation is probably that it's, uh, you can buy it as a flow-only uh, system, and then you can upgrade it at the hospital later on uh, to a flow and imaging system. Uh, the probes. 
which are really the sensors. Uh, they are sold as consumables, can be reused and sterilized 50 times. There's one family for cardiac use and one family for vascular use. Uh, and we also see here the uh, high frequency uh, ultrasound probe uh, on the picture here. We are trying to offer our technology as flexibly as possible. And uh, you can buy these products either as a capital sales or capital purchase. Uh, in the US and also now from this year in the UK, we are offering the technology as a paper procedure model, so outplacing the systems and selling smart cards to activate the systems for one operation at a time. Or we are also offering lease models and actually hybrids of these uh, alternatives. Um, the financial performance, uh, starting by just taking a look at the highlights from 2022. So this was the best year ever for both our revenue and our EBIT. And uh, we're seeing very good growth here. I think the most important thing to notice is the good growth in imaging sales. Of course, we are working hard to convert this flow market to a flow and imaging market. This is growing 44% in 2022, so that's a great sign. At the same time, the, image, or the flow portfolio is also growing nicely, uh, more than 10%. Um, then vascular is also uh, really uh, taking off with the sales growth of 27%, but the cardiac is also keeping up very nicely at 18.8%. And we can see that all the geographical regions are contributing, but the US is really leading the way here. It's the best uh, EBIT result we have achieved and the best margin uh, as well. And uh, it's the way we like to see it. Mentioning US, and this is just to show how the number of procedures has been growing per year. Um, about 12% since 2013 per year. So really showing that it's uh, uh, a great adoption of this technology uh, going on in the US uh, at the moment and has been so for, for some years already. Okay, so this means that we are actually adding another strong year to our history. Um, and uh, we can see here the 10 years CAGR for sales is at 10.4% and 10 years CAGR for profit is 13.1%. So consistent and very nice results. Uh, we're also showing strong cash flow, high equity ratio, no long-term liabilities and a return on invested capital of 49.5% last year and a positive trend curve there as well. And the last, we have had a policy to pay off dividends since the IPO in 2004, and there is a proposal now for the General Assembly of paying out 4.50 NOx per share uh, for 2023. Looking now at the future, and how are we going to continue this growth um, story? Here on this slide, I'm trying to depict, if we're looking at the various uh, segments for growth, we can see that cabbage surgery represents a 2 billion NOx annual uh, sales opportunity for us. About half comes from the flow uh, technology, half comes from imaging. Vascular surgery adding 1.5 billion additional, about uh, the same uh, in flow and in imaging. And there's also something here called other open heart surgery, which is the use of our probes or, or imaging probe for other applications. Not something that we are really strategically driving, but it's an opportunity uh, as well. And this is just indicating the current uh, sales uh, and showing there's a lot of open opportunity here. So how are we going to capture this 4.5 billion NOx of opportunity? And this is the current sales or 2022 sales of our own products. Of course, we mean, want to continue to grow in cabbage, win new hospitals, win new users, the same in vascular. Grow with the flow, it's uh, large markets remaining both for cabbage and vascular. High frequency ultrasound imaging, relevant for both cabbage and vascular and uh, grow the use of the imaging probe in other open heart surgery. Last but not least, go direct in more countries. As I mentioned, Canada as of yesterday. And we can see that the trends are positive. We see a tendency to accelerate the growth for the totality of our own products, but certainly so for the imaging portfolio and also for the vascular products. And uh, how we're going to achieve this is by 
addressing the flow market and working to convert that install base to a, a flow and imaging uh, technology. Work on the, uh, on the markets where we have not achieved complete routine use yet, but are working hard every day to achieve that. And also looking at emerging markets which have more uh, higher power sensitivity and going out there with some adapted versions of the technology to, to really fit with that expectation. Uh, working, of course, to develop this vascular space. I mean, we have excellent track record and experience from doing this from the cardiac side, and uh, we feel that we are developing the vascular now very, very nicely as well. Direct market coverage again. So that's the strategy. And finally, just taking a look at the profitability and uh, whether this should be possible to continue to improve margins here. So we see that we've had a uh, continuous improvement in EBIT margin for the company um, in grey here, or in the total margin. And then we see in the, for our own product, which is the highest, obviously, 30.9% in 2022. And by uh, seeing that the growth of our own product is higher than the third-party products, this will continue to uh, drive uh, margin improvements. Also, the fact that sales of Miracu with the ultrasound provides a higher margin. Sales through our direct sales channels, now USA, Canada, more countries will come. Uh, and also longer term, I would say we're working on uh, production process improvements where we will see efficiency gains uh, and uh, improvements in the gross margin as well. So there are reasons to believe that we should be able to continue this uh, good uh, development. That was actually my introduction. The next very important and interesting uh, part of this meeting today is then to introduce our first speaker. And that is Professor John Puskas from uh, New York, uh, from Mount Sinai Health System. And uh, we've had the pleasure of working with John and his colleagues for actually a number of years already. And he is really one of the thought leaders within this space. He's uh, speaking at all the major conferences every year and has also established a new conference for uh, coronary uh, surgery, which is pretty amazing. Uh, he is in the forefront of developing and uh, testing out new technologies and techniques uh, within the cardiac uh, bypass space. Uh, he was also a lead investigator on the REQUEST trial. Um, which I hope most of you are familiar with, which was a very, very important trial, which was really demonstrating the clinical value for combining uh, flow measurements and high-frequency ultrasound uh, in cabbage surgery. Professor John Puskas. Thank you, Kari. Yeah. I appreciate it very much. And it's a delight to be here. Um, my second trip to Oslo, and uh, I'm just sad it's going to be a brief one this time. <clears throat> So I'm going to address the, the t uh, issue of the role that Medistim plays in coronary bypass surgery, present and, uh, I would argue, also into the future. These are my disclosures, perhaps the most important of which is that I serve as a consultant to Medistim, um, having signed on very recently. And the reason I agreed to serve as a consultant uh, to Medistim is because the corporate mission of Medistim is directly aligned with my own professional and academic mission, uh, which is to improve the quality of care of coronary bypass patients globally. What is coronary bypass uh, surgery? Well, it's frankly the only surgical therapy for the number one killer of human beings. Let's just pause for a minute and absorb that concept. This is the only surgical procedure devoted to combating the disease that kills most of us. It's not going away. Blood vessels from elsewhere in the patient's body are harvested and redeployed uh, to the heart, becoming conduits to deliver blood supply to the working muscle of the heart beyond a blockage in one of the native coronary arteries. So what future will coronary surgery have? Well, of course, we will have to invent that future. And that future will demand that we innovate and collaborate uh, to create new uh, technologies and techniques and to train young surgeons to perform these procedures. It will require collaboration between industry and academic and professional leadership in order to improve the procedure. And as Abraham Lincoln is quoted as saying, the best way to predict the future is to create it ourselves. 
MediaStim will play an increasing role in assessing or addressing the value imperative. We are pushed continuously to, to provide better value to our healthcare systems, to the insurers, to the federal government, and of course, value equals quality divided by cost. What MediaStim does is improve quality. You saw this slide uh, earlier from uh, Kari. Um, cornea bypass surgery is expanding globally, and the adoption of TTFM technology is also expanding, but more remains to be done. I'm going to predict that the future of coronary surgery will include many more cases, not fewer, and I'll show you why. The population is aging. We, as a global species, are undergoing an epidemic of diabetes, what we call cardiometabolic syndrome, obesity, and there's a global expansion of coronary bypass surgery into markets and countries that never performed it before. In fact, coronary disease is, is occurring in younger and younger patients in the developed world as well, and they are referred specifically for multiple and all artery bypasses, which is what I specialize in. I'm busier than I can possibly keep up with in New York City uh, because of obese, diabetic young people. I now operate, most of my patients are younger than I am, and I'm not that old. <laughs> and, and, and they're diabetic and obese, and they have multiple blockages, and because they have multiple blockages in multiple vessels and they're diabetic, they're much more suitable to be cared for with coronary surgery than with multiple stents. But this does require a more complex operation, and in some cases, we're dealing with patients who've had multiple previous stents, and that raises the bar in terms of complexity of the surgery. There's an increasing demand for less invasive operations, even as the procedure itself becomes more complex. And I'm going to show you some data at the end of this talk uh, to support the statement that I believe the gatekeeper role of the interventional cardiologist will transition away. Presently, when a patient receives uh, a diagnosis of coronary artery disease, we delineate the, blo the blockages in the arteries by performing a coronary angiogram. A catheter is inserted either through the femoral artery or the, uh, typically the right radial artery, and dye uh, is injected into the coronary arteries, and a cine x-ray is taken, a cine fluoroscopy is taken, and that makes images directly of the coronary arteries, a rather invasive way of documenting or diagnosing the exact location and number of the blockages. That also means that the person who's doing that procedure is the first one to talk to the patient about what should be done about those blockages. And that person is an interventional cardiologist who does not just perform diagnostic angiogram, but also performs stenting procedures. So this is what we call a gatekeeper role. For a patient to be referred for surgery, the individual who made the diagnosis and who also makes a living putting in stents must say, no stents, you should have an operation. And while many uh, practitioners will do that appropriately, some will not. And so you see wide variations in different cities, different practices, different hospitals in different countries in the ratio between stenting, what we call PCI, percutaneous coronary intervention, and coronary bypass surgery, the surgical treatment. The ratios vary by a factor of 10 across the globe. Obviously, humans don't vary in their biology by a factor of 10 across the globe. This is human behavior at work. And a big part of that is that the patient first hears about the, the diagnosis from a physician who makes a living doing stents. This is the gatekeeper role, and it's going to disappear. Not only uh, is that role going to disappear, but the onslaught of diabetes is a global problem. Diabetes and what we call the cardiometabolic syndrome is indeed a global epidemic, and interestingly, at the epicenter of that epidemic is the world's most populous country, or most populous democracy, India, uh, where we now have almost 60 million diabetic patients. How many times? That's something like, what, 10 times the population of Norway? And the burden of cardiovascular disease continues to rise. India, China, markets that are, we haven't even begun to scratch the surface. And this is, uh, these are slides provided to me by uh, Dr. O.P. Yadava, uh, the president of the Indian Association for Cardiothoracic Surgery and a good friend. I asked him what's going on in India with coronary bypass and he put together these slides and emailed them to me just two days ago. Um, 
estimating that uh, in uh, 2022, India performed about 160,000 coronary bypass operations. In 2023, it will pass the United States as the country performing the largest number of coronary surgeries on earth. And that will continue. So why does diabetes drive coronary bypass surgery? Well, this is the Freedom Trial, the take-home slide from the Freedom Trial published in the New England Journal about a decade ago. And these patients were all diabetic. They were randomized to have either multiple stents or coronary bypass surgery in a random allocation. And after two years of follow-up, you can see that the, death, the rate of death, stroke, or myocardial infarction, heart attack, began to increase in the PCI group and was not increasing as much in the coronary bypass group so that the curves diverge over time. By five years, there's a dramatic benefit for coronary bypass surgery compared to stenting for diabetic patients. And this is still the primary driver of coronary surgery. At seven years, mortality alone, not just the combination of mortality, myocardial infarction, and stroke, was in favor of cabbage by an accelerating margin over time. Why does that happen? <clears throat> Torsten Dunst from Germany published this just a couple of years ago in the uh, Journal of the American College of Cardiology, describing the, rel the benefit of coronary bypass surgery compared to the benefit of stenting. When we put in a stent, um, do we have a pointer? Oh, there it is, got it, okay, thanks. When we put a stent in a coronary artery that has a blockage, we open up a flow-limiting lesion. But adjacent lesions that are not flow-limiting are not stented, and they remain. And they are also typically more numerous than the flow-limiting lesion. So in the future, rupture of plaques and thrombosis that can occur in these non-flow-limiting lesions drives myocardial infarction rates in the patients who have had previous stents. And in fact, stenting does not prolong life. It relieves symptoms, but it doesn't extend life. There has never been a trial demonstrating that stents prolong life in patients with stable multivessel coronary artery disease. Only in the setting of acute heart attack do stents prolong life. But coronary bypass grafts function very differently. The coronary bypass graft delivers an alternate source of blood to the coronary artery beyond the proximal flow-limiting lesion and adjacent non-flow limiting lesions. So that if in the future these lesions close, the patient doesn't even notice. There's no heart attack. The patient goes on with their day and doesn't notice because these bypass grafts are providing alternate uh, sources of blood supply. They, in effect, prevent future myocardial infarction and protect the patient against events in the future. And that is fundamentally why coronary bypass surgery will never go away. Certainly, stents will never eliminate coronary bypass, and I would argue that we have passed sort of the, the peak. You, you've talked about peak oil. I'm talking about peak stenting. I think we just passed it. We just passed peak stenting because of diabetes as an epidemic on our planet. And because of the last set of images, I'm going to show you that the gatekeeper role for PCI operators is about to end. Nonetheless, coronary bypass has some problems. One of them is that we cause strokes in about 2% of our patients, and it's a, a big problem. This is the same trial, the Freedom trial, that showed that after five years, the rate of stroke in cabbage patients was about twice what it was in stent patients, and most of that occurred at the time of surgery. So we need to reduce the rate of stroke, and that's where that's one of the primary benefits of Medistim technology, is to interrogate the aorta in the operating room and guide the manipulation of the aorta so that the surgeon can customize the procedure for that particular patient to minimize risk of stroke. Because I consider this the Achilles heel of coronary surgery. It, it is almost nothing more disheartening to the surgeon than to fix a patient's heart and damage their brain. They don't think that's a good trade for the most part, and they're right. Now the use of the uh, epicardiac ultrasound, um, I, I call it ECUS, epicardiac ultrasound, or high uh, frequency ultrasound, the same thing. These are the, the imaging probe that Medi the Medistem cells. Uh, they're endorsed in the guidelines from numerous uh, cardiologic and cardiac surgical societies around the world, but interestingly, not routinely performed. Um, 
It's like the Pirates of the Caribbean phrase, you know, the code is really not a set of rules, it's a set of guidelines, right? You don't have to necessarily follow them, and in fact, practitioners often don't. Um, lay people might wonder, how can that possibly be? Well, it, it, it is. Um, but this represents opportunity, both for improving outcomes for cabbage patients and, frankly, for Medistim, because it's from uh, improving outcomes that Medistim will demonstrate value. So here's um, some of the images that we can get from the Medistim device. And, and you can see this aorta is thickened, it's irregular, this is shaggy calcified cholesterol and atherosclerosis. If we apply a clamp to that aorta, we are likely to uh, embolize debris. And feeling the aorta doesn't replace um, uh, an echo image. This is an aorta here, that circle is the aorta. This thing here looks like a stalactite from one of the caves in Norway, um, but in fact, it's just uh, an exuberant atherosclerosis in the, in the aorta. And if you put a clamp across that, it will dislodge, embolize, and cause some devastating problem. But even, it's not just those dramatic ones. Much less dramatic disease within the aorta can also embolize. Um, my new uh, friend and colleague from Helsinki, a vascular surgeon, will know that this medial thickening can sometimes be like toothpaste. It's a, and if you apply a clamp to that and fracture the intima, this toothpaste can embolize uh, and cause uh, um, uh, significant downstream problems. And this is often not palpable. So I commonly avoid aortic manipulation entirely by using what we call a no aortic touch coronary bypass, using bilateral internal thoracic arteries, the left and the right, and a radial artery used to extend those uh, to provide multiple outflows to the, to the three different arterial territories of the heart, avoiding manipulation of the ascending aorta that may contain calcium and cholesterol. And in fact, the European guidelines suggest or recommend uh, by, a, by a class one recommendation, the highest level of recommendation, that we should minimize aortic manipulation and that we should perform uh, epi-aortic ultrasound. Well, this is the Medistim device we're talking about with a class 2A recommendation. So, you know, it, it's interesting, I'm sure, for a layperson to see these are class 1 and class 2A recommendations in the European guidelines, and yet not all of Europe is doing it. Um, and other parts of the world are worse, not better. Um, now, the other device that many stem cells, and uh, which I use every day, is this transit time flow meter technology, the, the so-called flow probes, also endorsed by guidelines, but not routinely performed. And that represents opportunity for improving outcomes for coronary bypass patients by ensuring that every bypass graft is patent, and in other words, open, at the conclusion of every coronary bypass operation. What does that do? It prevents early post-operative myocardial infarction, which is commonly a fatal event, and therefore saves lives. So I'm going to show you some, uh, just a very few slides from the request registry. Uh, Kari mentioned this uh, study, which um, Medistim funded. I had the privilege of participating in it with uh, other uh, uh, leading surgeons from around the world, actually. We enrolled 1,000 patients at seven sites in Europe and North America. All of these patients were having coronary bypass surgery, and this was a non-randomized observational study. We performed our regular coronary bypass operations and used routinely TTFM and HIFU or ECUS uh, during the coronary bypass operation. And the purpose of this was to try to figure out um, whether these technologies, the flow probe or the imaging probe, would change what we do in the operating room. And of course, it's shown on this Mary Q uh, device. Interestingly, about one quarter of patients had some adjustment in the surgical strategy directed by information provided to the surgeon from the use of these devices. That's a big number, especially when you consider that worldwide there's almost a million coronary bypass operations performed annually. This means a quarter of a million patients would have some alteration or refinement of surgical strategy if every surgeon used the Medistim tools. About 10% of those were in uh, changes in how we would otherwise have manipulated the aorta, and that's to try to reduce the risk of stroke. About 20% were uh, identifying the best spot on the coronary artery to do the anastomosis. 
because you can't see through the wall of a vessel with your eye. You can't see this thing on the back wall of that vessel, but if you plug your bypass graft in here instead of here, if it's above instead of below uh, the obstruction, well, you, you've got a problem, or the patient has a problem. Uh, and about 3%, and this is a big number to surgeons, we're like, whoa, 3%, really? That 3% of the anastomoses, the thing we surgeons pride ourselves in being able to do, connect one artery to another, 3% were revised, in other words, redone, uh, in the operating room based on low flow or high pulsatility index, and after revision, better outcomes. And you saw the Curry showed a, a case of a similar sort of identification of a problem based on low flow and revision of the graph with improvement of flow. So I'm going to show you some cases from my own operating room. I, I work at the Mount Sinai Healthcare System. I lead the Department of Cardiovascular Surgery at Morningside Hospital in, in New York. I teach residents and fellows coronary surgery. I try to do it in such a way that they learn and the patients don't suffer. Um, sometimes I fail. So here's a resident uh, learning to harvest what we call a skeletonized internal thoracic artery or internal mammary artery. But even before we use that artery, we notice it does pretty meager flow. And there's a localized purple region in its midsection. And when we look at this with the ultrasound, we can see a flap in the artery. And there's a local dissection. What is the dissection? The layers of arteries, the walls of arteries have layers, typically three layers. And those layers are like plywood. Right, you can, you, one quarter inch plywood is hard to break over your knee. In fact, you can't break a quarter inch plywood over your knee. But if you soak that plywood in a puddle for two weeks and then come back and the layers of the plywood are delaminated, you can break individual layers with your fingers and you can certainly break them over your knee. You can break a simple piece of pine one quarter inch over your knee. But if the layers of the plywood are together, you can't break it over your knee. It's strong because of the layers. If you break the layers apart, it becomes weak. If a dissection is when the layers of the wall of the artery are split by a crack in the inner layer and blood traveling between the layers, and that limits flow and ultimately closes the vessel. So we call this a dissection. The layers of the wall have split apart, and that is a really bad thing. We can't have that. So what we did was we identified the local dissection, we cut the vessel in half, we removed the part that was damaged, and we put it back together end to end, and then used it for bypass grafting. The ECOS, or HIFU, told us where to go, where to cut. So now this is the second case. If we put the internal mammary graft to the anterior wall of the heart, the LAD, the most important artery in the heart, and the flow is medi mediocre, what do we do? I had helped my uh, senior resident uh, perform a four-vessel bypass, and this was the flow uh, to the LAD, just five cc's per minute with a pulsatility index that's higher than five um, and uh, a very spiky pattern here, not what we want to see. And we were guided by the Medistim uh, to redo that graft, even though the patient was stable. This is an off-pump bypass. The heart is continuing to beat throughout the case. And in fact, it was not apparent clinically that there was a problem with that graft. But with a TTFM, we saw that there was. And when I redid the graft, we had a flow of 23, a pulse stability index less than three, a good diastolic fraction, and a good graft. So this patient left the operating room with the most important graft working very well because we'd used TTFM. And had we not used TTFM, we would have left the operating room with a defective graft. I had seen or thought I'd seen every stitch placed by my junior during the anastomosis, but the end result was not acceptable. We redid it. Looking at the, the vessel anastomosis as we took it down uh, and redid it, maybe there was a little asymmetry at the toe. Perhaps one of the stitches near the toe of the anastomosis had not been perfect. I extended the anastomosis, redid it myself, and we had a much improved outcome. But the, the take-home message to me was that the, the problem with this very important graft was not evident by other metrics in the operating room. We would not have known without the TTFM. We would have missed that. This is quality, trying to get from a 98% perfect result to a 100% perfect result. You have to be looking with technology that exceeds your eyes and your hands. Another use for the uh, HIFU or ECOS is to find coronary arteries. 
Most of the time, we humans have coronary arteries on the outside surface of the heart, just like the veins on the back of your hand are visible. But about 2% of us will have those arteries buried in the muscle, invisible on the outside of the heart. And that's a problem for the surgeon to try to find those vessels, especially in a beating heart. So here was a middle-aged gentleman, younger than I, uh, having um, a coronary bypass. We open the pericardium, the sac that holds the heart, and we cannot find this most important artery, the left anterior descending artery. We use the ECOS device, and it allows us to find uh, the ideal site to cut down through the muscle to find the LED and graft it. And we did this without a problem, and the patient did well. These are the images that we had. So this is the epicardial surface. There's muscle. This is the left anterior descending artery. You can see a little hump in it. That became our target. This is more muscle between the artery and this in here is the, the cavity of the pumping chamber of the heart, the ventricle. Obviously, we don't want to cut into that. that that's a cardiac perforation, and that's a, a bad problem, uh, difficult to fix. Um, we want to find this spot without finding that spot. And we're able to do that. Now, another case of an intramyocardial LED using the ECOS, and this is, again, why the imaging is becoming almost equal in value to the flow uh, for Medistim and for us surgeons. A great example, we had uh, very recently an older gentleman from England on a cruise ship arrives in New York. He's with his girlfriend, interesting. He has a heart attack before they get to New York. Life's good. Um, and he gets to New York... Um, he's brought in an ambulance to my hospital and she goes back on the plane to London and um, he has a, a, you know, a, a weak heart his, uh, the ejection fraction is low uh, he suffered a significant myocardial infarction we uh, recover him medically and then bring him to the operating room for um, <clears throat> uh, an off pump bypass he needs a double bypass and we're going to use bilateral internal thoracic arteries um, but when we open the pericardium, we can only see the left anterior descending at the tip of the heart, the distal end, where it's pretty small. And the uh, internal mammary arteries, or internal thoracic arteries, will not reach all the way out there. And we can't find the LED more proximally. So what do we do? We're going to use this technology. And this, these are the images from his heart. Here's the surface of the heart. Way down here is the left anterior descending artery, and right there is the chamber of the heart. So in this gentleman, his uh, LAD was so deep in the muscle that it was intimate with the, the, with the uh, inside of the cha pumping chamber of the heart, the ventricle. So that is truly no man's land. We can't go there. But as we go towards the tip of the heart, <clears throat> we find that the LAD is rising up in, in the muscle, <clears throat> and we can then find a spot where we can reach uh, through a thinner area of muscle with some safety be beneath us to, to, to bypass that LAD. So that's what we did. We did a little fancy uh, work with the two mammary arteries, cutting one off and sewing it to the other in order to reach to the apex. Um, and uh, we ended up with this result. There's the left mammary artery coming to the lateral wall of the heart and the right mammary artery attached to it com coming down to the anterior descending coronary artery. And here's the flow. Uh, in both of those, the right mammary to the LED with great flow and the left mammary to the circumflex with great flow. So routine flow uh, assessment should be considered. It's a two-way recommendation in the European guidelines from the European Society of Cardiology and the European Association of Cardiothoracic Surgery. Uh, I think it's actually bizarre that coronary bypass is the only major vascular procedure that does not require um, routine confirmation of graft patency at the end of the case. I'm going to show you um, a couple of slides about um, a complex operation that also requires uh, flow meter. This is what we call hybrid revascularization. It's the planned combination of surgery and stenting in the same patient. Typically for two different territories, uh, we're going to combine a robotic bypass with a stent in a coronary artery. I'm going to show you in this one case, two vessel coronary artery disease. In a, a Jehovah's Witness, this is a religious group, mostly in America, and they refuse blood transfusion. They would rather die than have a, bi than a blood transfusion. Um, he had other medical problems as well, an unstable angina. This is his coronary angiogram. I mentioned that uh, gatekeeper role. This is a traditional coronary, coronary angiogram, and you can see a blockage right there. 
and here also a, a narrowed uh, segment of the right coronary artery. And so this is the operating room set up. We have standard monitoring. This is the robot, uh, and the patient is actually um, on the table here, and the console where we're going to work uh, is, is in the corner of the room. Uh, we uh, connect the robot to the trocars, which are inserted in the, in the uh, uh, left chest, uh, and then I sit down at this uh, machine. I put my head in this machine, um, and I have um, binocular 3D vision inside the chest, and that's a trocar in, in the chest. Through that trocar, we insert these instruments, um, and then those instruments are used uh, to harvest the internal mammary artery that's hidden behind the glistening uh, layer inside the chest. And here we are using cautery to harvest that. We're going to make uh, tracks and harvest that artery. Then we uh, connect that internal mammary to the uh, LAD uh, through a little incision. You can see us using the camera to identify the right spot for that incision. The incision is just about that long. It's about three and a half, four centimeters. Uh, and there's my fingertips to give you some perspective to the size. That's the heart down there. And we're going to sew uh, that uh, uh, internal mammary to the LED. But when you're doing an operation through limited access, you especially want to know that the flow is good. So we always use the transit time flow meter in that setting. And in this particular patient, we had a lovely flow and a low pulsatility index. And then after that, the patient has an, next day, the patient has an angiogram and they stent the right coronary artery and the patient can go home uh, the following day. Here he is four weeks later uh, with very minimal incisions and no incision in the center of the chest. So this is a popular thing for patients. Only a small fraction of patients actually have the right kind of blockages for this procedure. But when we can do it, we always use the transit time flow meter. Uh, and it's a popular thing for patients. Now, this is my last uh, little uh, set of slides. Um, I want This is about the, the gatekeeper role. Uh, and this is a trial that's ongoing, the so-called fast-track trial. Some of you may know the name Patrick Sorois. He's probably the most famous living cardiologist in Europe. Um, very controversial gentleman. He's almost 80 years old now, and he's reinvented himself um, doing a very controversial clinical trial called the fast-track trial. Previously, he created the scoring system that's called the syntax score to quantitate how complex and extensive are the blockages in a patient's heart and using that score to allocate the patient to have either medications, stents plus medicines, or surgery plus medicines. Um, and now he's gone a step farther and testing to see uh, whether um, CTA, CAT scan angiography, non-invasive coronary angiography combined with what's called fractional flow reserve by CAT scan. These are digital assessments of the coronary arteries without catheterization. It's a four-minute scan with a simple IV in your hand. No catheterization of the arteries, zero risk, um, zero discomfort. Um, it, it's, it is the future. And I had a glimpse of the future because I uh, volunteered to be the only surgeon in America, North America, enrolling patients in this trial. In this trial, patients are referred for coronary bypass on the basis of an angiogram they've already had. And then a non-operating surgical teammate of mine says, yes, that patient should have a coronary bypass surgery. Then the patient agrees to be in the trial, agrees to have this CAT scan angiogram and CAT scan fractional flow reserve, uh, the um, software is provided by a company called HeartFlow in California. And I, the operating surgeon, see only the non-invasive uh, images and plan and conduct the operation based solely on that without seeing the coronary angiogram. So I, I've done uh, maybe 8,000 heart operations in my career, at least 5,500 uh, coronary bypasses. This is the first time I've ever operated on a patient based solely on a CTA. At 30 days, the patient gets another CTA, CTFFR, and what that does is it tells us what bypass grafts the surgeon actually did, whether they are open, and what is the residual burden of coronary artery disease in that patient, the so-called residual syntax score. So here's my first patient uh, from uh, the end of November. So this is quite recently. I've enrolled 10 patients in this trial. 
the, pay, the trial will have 114. It'll finish very soon. In the next month or so, we'll complete enrollment. Um, but this is the very first one and the very first CTA I'd ever worked with. These are the images we get. You saw the images earlier of the, of the coronary angiogram. This is what we get with a CAT scan. 3D reconstructions of the heart actually uh, showing us digital images of the arteries. These numbers actually indicate the... Uh, surgeons use words, cardiologists use numbers to identify uh, the specific branches of the specific arteries on the heart. It's like dentists describing teeth with a number. It's like their own code. Uh, this is the cardiologist code, so I, got, I learned to speak their language in numbers. But also, the machine will create these images too, uh, which show the calcium in the blockages in the arteries of the heart. Then it breaks down to right coronary artery, and these are all the images of the right coronary artery with careful identification of the blocked areas. Then the machine digitally linearizes this vessel and tells us the distance between the blockages so I can plan my bypasses with specific digital information. And it does that for each of the arteries. Now we're at the LAD, and we see all the blockages in that vessel. We identify each one of them. We can see them up close. We can linearize the vessel, measure the distance between the blockages to help me plan my bypass operation. So the same with the left circumflex artery. All the blockages and the linearized vessel then it produces this thing called the syntax score. I mentioned that earlier. Dr. Sorois uh, created this. Um, and it's very important because if your syntax score is less than 22, you should either have medicines or a stent, but not surgery. If your score is between 22 and 32, stenting and coronary bypass are both alternatives, depending on the feasibility and geometry of the, of the blockages. Above 32, all those patients should have coronary bypass surgery because stents are actually dangerous for the patient. Just too much metal, too many stents. 66 is kind of off the charts. That's a really sick patient that should have, clearly have bypass surgery, and that's a lot of blockage. Here's the real reason that the gatekeeper role is going to disappear, because there's an AI algorithm, the Syntex Score 2, that Dr. Sorois has created, which will tell us the 10-year mortality with PCI versus the 10-year mortality with cabbage, or the five-year event rate for major adverse cardiac events, death stroke MI, uh, for PCI or cabbage. And you can see that there's about a 20% difference in survival over 10 years for this patient with such extensive disease in favor of cabbage over PCI. If this information were presented to the patient by a non-biased clinician, decision-making would be different, and allocation of patients to different therapies would comply to the guidelines more, and I would venture to guess that the ratio between PCI and cabbage would become much more uniform across the globe. The machine goes on now. Uh, this is AI. Uh, it creates uh, this, what do you want to call this, a cartoon uh, of the coronary arteries of this particular patient with each of the branches, and they're color-coded to indicate the restriction of blood flow, and they are numerically labeled to tell us the actual physics of the fractional flow reserve at that point on that artery. And that guides my coronary bypass operation. And get a functional syntax score. This is the, um, what we plan to do. I plan to use the right mammary and the left mammary. The right mammary with a piece of radial is going to go to the, P, the posterior descending artery, that's number four, and then around the back of the heart to the, po the left posterior descending, which is 14B. The left mammary is going to go to the diagonal, number nine, and to the end of the LAD, number eight, and a piece of radial off the side of that over to the first obtuse marginal vessel, which is 12A. That was what I planned to do, and indeed, that's what we did. So we did what we would say we would do. So how did that work out? Here are the studies, the, the same patient, repeated study at 30 days after surgery. And we can see that all the bypasses are what we said they were going to be, and they're all open. So here's the right mammary with a piece of radial going to the posterior descending and around the back of the heart to the last branch of the circumflex system. Here we can see it here to 4 and 14B. Here's the left mammary touching down on the diagonal here and on the LED here, 
and a piece of radial coming off it going over uh, to the radial off the lima coming over to the obtuse marginal. So now the residual syntax score, which was initially 66, is now 2. So this patient no longer has significant coronary artery disease at all after five arterial bypass grafts. That's without having a diagnostic coronary angiogram involved in their care. So if we can take a patient with this number and make it this number, then the gatekeeper role of the interventional cardiologist, the days for that are numbered. It's not going to go on forever. And as a result, more patients will be referred for appropriate coronary bypass. And I think you'll see that AI will drive this. And insurers and federal payers will say, we're not paying for six or eight or 10 stents at intervals every six months for the next five years. If the AI algorithm says the patient should have coronary bypass, that's what they are going to be presented with as an option. And so I think you're going to see an uptick, a significant uptick in coronary bypass based on this technology. This is a, these are, I'm showing you one patient, my first patient that has now gone through the 30-day 30 30 follow-up of a trial that hasn't been completed and has not been published. So I don't know what the trial is going to show. I just can tell you what it's showing in my patients is that we don't need a diagnostic coronary angiogram. And that means the gatekeeper role for the interventional cardiologist is doomed. And that will mean more cabbages. I've been thankful to uh, Kari and to um, Medistim because they've been very helpful in promoting the field of coronary surgery. We dedicated a chapter in our, uh, David Taggart from Oxford and I uh, um, published this recently with the Ox Oxford University T Press. It's the only big textbook devoted solely to coronary bypass surgery. And there's a whole chapter on uh, using TTFM uh, to, uh, as a quality assessment tool in coronary surgery. Um, Medistim has also been actively involved in supporting the International Coronary Congress, uh, which is the only uh, annual meeting uh, that is devoted solely to coronary bypass surgery. We have it every other year in New York. It was New York its inaugural year, then in New Delhi, New York, Beijing, New York, COVID, COVID, and we were in, in Tokyo uh, just uh, a few months ago. We will be back in New York uh, in December of this year and in London um, uh, in December of 14, uh, of 24, rather. Uh, among the many topics that we discuss are interoperative graft assessment and quality uh, control because um, this in the end is what we do. We have to demonstrate that uh, before we close the patient, the bypass grafts are working. And we have to do the surgery in a way that minimizes the risk of stroke. Uh, and so now I get back to my first comment. The reason I agreed to be a consultant to Medistim is that they only sell two things. And those two things are devoted to reducing the risk of stroke in coronary surgery and ensuring that bypass grafts are patent in coronary surgery. That promotes quality in the only surgical procedure that is dedicated to fighting the number one killer of all of us. Thank you. Introduce our second speaker. And that is uh, Professor Vikatma from Helsinki. And uh, Professor uh, Vikatma has also been working with our technology for a long time, really extensive experience from the whole field of vascular surgery, both endovascular procedures and open surgical procedures. Uh, many, many procedures with our equipment under his belt. He was former board member on the European Society of, of uh, Vascular Surgery, currently the leader of the Finnish Society of Vascular Surgery. So also a thought leader within his space. Uh, good to be here, and I could not agree more with John on, on many of the, of the things. Uh, I'm talking about peripheral vascular surgery, and what is peripheral? Why, why did I become a peripheral vascular surgeon? was because it's more agile. Agility, agility is, a, is a modern word in, in business as well. And uh, we haven't done diagnostic uh, angiographies for 20 years or so. So we do MRA, we do CAT scans, we do ultrasound, and we base our, all our operations on uh, non-invasives. And I would agree with that. In carotid surgery, it took like one or two years before everybody abandoned the, the uh, catheterizations. Um, 20 years ago, I had to choose between cardiac and, and peripheral vascular surgery, and uh, Cardiac it was a very established thing, whereas uh, peripheral vascular surgery was growing very fast. There was new innovations. It was, it was for me, 
a, a, a better option. I've been happy since um, because we are the gatekeepers, so, so we do the stenting and the bypasses and the operations ourselves. Uh, we do hybrid operations all the time. Uh, and uh, we have much more uh, different areas to operate at. So as, as the surgeons have the purpose of returning people into the society, to the society to do things that they're supposed to do, uh, the heart has the purpose to uh, supply the rest of the body uh, with blood uh, so that blood can do the things that we want to do. So, so for me, uh, it was a more appealing part of medicine uh, am I biased? Uh, obviously, we are all biased in some way. Uh, we try to and tend to think that we are not biased. Uh, Medistim doesn't pay me enough to be biased. Um, <laughs> the University Hospital of Helsinki has paid my salary for 25 years or so, uh, take out a couple of visits abroad. Uh, I had five interesting years. Uh, as you can see, I started 17 actually to, uh, as a treasurer of the society. And you remember there were some incidents like the COVID. So we had to reinvent the economics of the European society during that time. We also bypassed our American friends, our journalists, the leading journal in the world. And uh, we created a program of guidelines and webinars and stuff like that. So it was also very uh, agile uh, working in the society. Kari said, I'm the president of the Finnish Savasco Society. That's not true. I'm the president of the Su Society of Surgery because I believe in collaboration. We do a lot of operations with urology, uh, GI surgeons, uh, also cardiac surgeons uh, together. So, so I'm running the, the, the surgical society. We had a meeting last week uh, in Lapland and it's, it's very good discussions to discuss with different uh, specialities. I try to keep my presentation uh, in time and, uh, and, and on a very basic level. I'm focusing on Finland. You know, we're the happiest country in the world. Uh, this is our hospital centralized system uh, in Helsinki, where by the sea, we actually now have a new restaurant that has sea view, very beautiful, uh, uh, towards, uh, towards west. So, so we have a nice sun in the afternoon. Uh, we divide our country into five regions. It's 5.5 uh, million, so a bit like Norway. Uh, the people uh, live in the south and uh, reindeer in the north. Um, and uh, and uh, this area that we uh, cover with this university hospital is about 1.7 million primary catchment area. Our secondary catchment area is 2.3 and tertiary catchment area is 5.5 million people. And uh, some, some functions are centralized to Helsinki, obviously. The, uh, uh, the uh, patients from abroad are quite rare. They used to be more common when the Americans were working still in Russia and they wanted their personnel to be operated in Helsinki because it was much cheaper than, than operating in Mount Sinai. Uh, we do about 5,000 and so um, uh, annual operations, so uh, both endovascular and open arterial. So that's about the volume for 1.72 million uh, persons annually. Uh, this slide actually shows the, the topic of today. So since 1971, we've been gathering uh, endovascular and open surgical procedures. You can, do, you can see that we do more endovascular procedures than we do open surgical procedures. Uh, the re main reason for this is that redo procedures for the same patients are more common in the endovascular area than, than in open surgery. Of course, we do redo in open surgery as well, but you can see that since the last 10 or so, 15 years, it, the, the number of open surgeries has been, been quite stable, so it's not going down. Uh, and, and the endovascular procedures are, are also stable-ish, uh, 2,000, 2,500. So that peak in 21 is still there, but it's, it came down a bit in 22. Uh, this we have had since 2003, these hybrid theaters where you can do surgery and angiography for the same patient at the same time simultaneously. And it has a long learning curve. So if the cardiac surgeons are now starting the hybrid operations, it will take you like 10 years before you reach a plateau. Uh, today, uh, you can see the usage. We have four uh, hybrid operation theaters, one for neurosurgeons, three for vascular surgeons, where the cardiac uh, cardiologist actually put every now and then a TAVI, a, a, a aortic valve, a very good procedure as well. Uh, 
Well, that's the distribution of the operations, which is quite stable. But this is interesting. This was uh, for my presentation last week, but I took it here because this is the main theater, which is soft tissue surgery, without orthopedics and trauma mainly. We have some urology, but, but GI surgery, cardiac surgery, and vascular surgery are the three big ones. And these are the hours last year spent in the OR, and you see that we are slower than the cardiac surgeons because we spend more hours, and the GI surgeons are, are at least. But, but you see we've outnumbered also in the number of operations uh, the cardiac surgical procedures today. So to the only a couple of slides about TTFM. The real difference between TTFM and ultrasound flow, you can measure flow with ultrasound as well, also intraoperatively. During the 20 or so years, there's been a couple of uh, tri tries in the market with very high frequency ultrasound probes measuring the, the, the flow. But the difference is that whereas this looks at the actual movement within the vessel, uh, like this, it, it doesn't assume that the thing, in this case the vessel, is round. Whereas ultrasound does, which leads to a problem because uh, the, the mistake in the measurement is also exponential, whereas it's linear and the TTFM. So that's why TTFM is a better measure of flow during surgery than traditional ultrasound. Uh, it, it's uh, simple mathematics. Uh, early on, my, my former uh, uh, boss, Anders Albeck, uh, did his thesis in 2000 about the, the bypass grafts uh, and, and their patency. So this means that how long uh, the, the, the grafts stay open. And he could show in his thesis in a very small group that, that when the flow was above 90, uh, the probability of staying open was much higher uh, than when the flow was, was below 90. So this is early work with the TTFM device. I don't know if it was Transonic or Med Med Medistim or even, I don't know when Medistim company. I didn't know the name Medistim for a couple of years ago, so, so I'm not attached that much. And, and this is another study from his thesis where he could show that the flow quartiles uh, also predicted graft, uh, the need for a redo PTA or, or redo bypass, redo correction, so, so graft uh, stenosis. Uh, there are no exact, one of the problems with TTFM or any flow measurement is that there are no exact cutoff values. This is uh, one of the uh, uh, early uh, uh, series of, of more than 8,000 measurements and we, we kind of had the femoral popliteal, femoral crural, so meaning that you do a bypass from groin to the popliteal region, groin to the smaller ones, which are about a bit bigger actually than, than, than the coronary arteries, uh, but then we, when you go to the foot, the foot to save a leg, uh, then they are the size of the coronary artery, but the bypass is much longer, uh, which means that there's a lot more problems also uh, in the graft. So we need to be very certain that the grafts are okay when we're leaving the, the OR. And you, here you can see, see the assumed cutoff limits where, from where and, and our experience we published, I think this is the only table pu published uh, uh, from the recommendations of the flow, what they should be within the peripheral vascular field. Uh, and this is what we see in, in, in practice, what the flow should be uh, about. Our friends, uh, well, our friends are Alec and Matt uh, Menard, but, uh, but uh, the Americans he, well, uh, got uh, a lot of money. Uh, I think it was 40 million from the Obama administration to, to try to find a solution to a question that had been addressed previously with randomized studies, but they were not very good. Um, there, there is a Basel 1 and Basel 2 trial which are, which are the, the UK based, but there's a problem in recruitment and also problem because the stenosis or occlusion actually in, in our case, it, it can be anywhere from, from the descending thoracic aorta to the, to the malleolar level, so, and, and there's a lot of occlusion. So, so the variability of treatment methods is, is very big, but the beauty in this best CLI was that when Alec came for the first time to Helsinki to present it, they tried to find this equipoise, uh, so, so that the surgeon and the angioradiologist and the, and the vascular surgeon, they agreed that this patient can be treated with any of the methods, either intraluminally and in endovascularly or with a bypass surgical surgery. And we, 
were the uh, first and only site in, in Finland and outside US actually to recruit in this one. Uh, uh, there was some other center, one, one other center in Italy, but otherwise this is a very American study. Uh, and um, what they did was that they, they, they chose, the, this is one cohort, there's another cohort as well, but, but this, is, this is the main, main finding. So they, they, they had 1,400 pa or so patients, and then they randomized whether to do open or, or bypass, and the treating physicians had to agree that it's, this can be done in, in, in any of the uh, methods. And, and this is a well-designed, well uh, performed study. The main finding is in the upper left-hand corner that, that the event rate of the major reinvention uh, reintervention above angle amputation or all cause death, uh, which was not different. As you can see, people do die if they have atherosclerosis. They have about, in claudication, about 20% chance of dying in five years. So the treatment with statins and cholesterol treatment and aspirin, that's very important. But they don't die because of their leg. But they do, they get complications like amputations and so. And the most clearly it was seen, uh, as I said, in the reintervention. Uh, so this is the first time to show in the randomized fashion that bypass surgery uh, in the lower limb is, is uh, more durable than, uh, than um, uh, endovascular treatment in patients where you can do choose either. And this is in numbers. You can see that the number of, of interventions in the bypass surgical group is, uh, in, if you look, if you look, this is, this is around two, three years, you, you see that there's 100 uh, reintervention. Uh, so you can count the numbers, the economical figures from here as well. They are about as costly because the devices are more expensive in the endovascular group, but, uh, but the surgical treatment and the post-operative treatment is, is uh, uh, more costly in the open surgical group. So our routine just highlighted the routine here. So we do for every patient, we do a bypass on, we do a TTFM. We do selective imaging either with an angio or, or with an ultrasound. I nowadays do always uh, proximal and distal uh, uh, ultrasound because, because it is there, because we have it all the time. Somebody asked if there's a competition on the market, not on the TTFM, but ultrasound you can do with almost any device. The beauty in the medicine, device is that it's very high flow and that the probe is very good so you can see very clearly the small details. But ultrasound does exist in, in all the GE, Philips, Siemens, Samsung has the best image quality at the moment uh, in the monitors. So, so that does exist but TTFM uh, does not. So this is, this is uh, what we do. This is just an example, a, a groin procedure uh, with a bifurcated venous bypass. There was an infection in the groin. Uh, we had to take out the artery and replace that one. Uh, and uh, post, uh, in the end, we measured the flow uh, in the superficial femoral artery, which is the one that goes down. You could see a, a reasonably good flow. Uh, pulsatility in this 3.8 is a bit high, but in the deep femoral, which takes the blood in, into the thigh area, uh, there was almost no flow. So we had to do some cor cor corrective measures. Uh, and then it was corrected, and prior to dilatation, we do, we do that with heroin, actually. It's uh, called papaverin, it's a heroin surrogate. Uh, it makes a maximal dil dilatation of the, of the vessels. Uh, we could see that the flow went up to, to uh, 270 mils per minute, uh, pulsatility index down to one, and then, then we could be happy with the, with the correction. So this is how uh, a threatened limb looks like. This is just the case with a, fem uh, a patient who had a fempop prox uh, previously and it occluded. Uh, there was a very experienced surgeon, fairly good quality uh, vein. They did and completed an angio, but still the bypass was occluded one day uh, at one day. In the primary operation, they did a, an, an angio, but here you can, if you, if you look at this region up here, you can see a quite nice uh, proximal area, but, uh, and, oh, okay, sorry, then we checked the, because there's an end-to-end -end anastomosis in the graft, for example, we checked that, we checked also with ultrasound the distal anastomosis, and what we finally found was in the proximal anastomosis there was a clamp damage, you can see that here's a, 
Uh, here's the dissection, as John was also showing. Uh, and, and here you can see the first image, but when, when you take a new image and you turn the patient a bit around, or, or the C-arm a bit around, you see that it should have been seen also already in the, in the first uh, part. And that was then corrected, and the patient did, did fine. Uh, the, the, I told you that the beauty in the probe is that it's readily available and you can either look before the, you do the bypass or whatever. This is similar to what John showed, that you don't want to do the bypass here, but you want to do it here, so the anastomosis. Uh, so that's, that's fairly similar in, in, in our case. Uh, and then you can check, and I think these images are quite interesting because you can see the flow and you can see in the B mode, without the colors and without the, the, the other stuff, uh, that, that blood actually flows quite slowly in the arteries. Even in the aorta, which you would intuitively, I at least thought originally, that it goes very fast, because if you open an aorta, it comes quite fast out. But, but there is a resistance all the time. And here you can see, with the, with the good quality ultrasound, you can see small details in the flow pattern. And what is, what is most important, I will maybe show in, in a later picture, what you can see is the proximal end here. So the intima media that John was talking about, you can actually see the intima media. And that's a, that's a difference to most of the, the ultrasound probes. This is rubbish, this, this doesn't tell you much. It looks nice in the picture, but it, but it doesn't tell you much. So it's actually the B-mode image that we look at. Of course, we sometimes check uh, the flow and so forth, but that, that is in all, the, I mean, in all the machines. It has to be adjusted quite a lot to get the colors right and so forth. It's very, very valuable when you do venous imaging or if you do graft control and stuff like that with ultrasound, but, but so far, it's not yet good uh, for intraoperative use. It will be in the future, I'm sure. Um, Ross Naylor used to be, like for 30 years, the, the man on both sides of the Atlantic to talk about carotid surgery. He was my opponent in 2011 in my thesis. And when he went on pension, he took one more task to do the, the, the new guide, the updated guidelines. They were the original ones from 2017 or the latest ones, and now he updated them quite recently. Um, and uh, this is the European Society, that is the opinion leader globally at the moment. Uh, and and the 77 recommendation, which is a new one, is now recommending that there should be a completion control. So virtually now all the guidelines say that when you're finishing the surgery, you should do a completion control. And Christoph Knappi, who's the only, only uh, quote here, uh, is a friend of ours in, in Munich, and, and Christoph has actually the, exactly the same protocol in the carotid field uh, as, as we've been doing in, in Helsinki. So carotid surgery, why do we do carotid surgery? Because we don't want to get the strokes, and strokes is bad, so that's why we do carotid surgery. Why do we want to perform good quality co uh, co completion control? Because we don't want to cause the strokes. There's a 0.3 to 3% risk to 6% allowed risk in the very risky patients of stroke uh, uh, within 30 days of the surgery. So we want to leave out the operation room. We do actually patients in local anesthesia, we, so we see that they don't get any problems during the surgery. But then when we leave that, uh, we actually, what we see on there is, is uh, uh, only the beautiful surface, but we want to see a bit deeper. Uh, and that's why we perform ultrasound uh, at the end of, uh, since, since uh, five years, we've, we've been doing a routine uh, ultrasound uh, at the end of every carotid operation. There are some problems still. The nurse has to, to work the machine and so forth, but, but actually they are doing that well, quite well. Uh, uh, so, so this device in our hands works quite routinely uh, and well. This is just to show you what it, what it means when you do an ultrasound before you clamp the, the carotid artery. So you want to put the clamp there. This is called a floating thrombus. It moves like that. And if it loosens up from there, it goes up north, as they say, and you get the stroke. And that's what it looks like when you open the artery. Uh, and it, you can see that it's quite loosely uh, attached here. So, so you don't want to manipulate it. So it's important to know that it, it is there. Then you see a lot of damages. If you look at the scale here, there's 15 millimeters here, 
seven here. So this every, everything here is, is one millimeter, and this is a clamp damage, but we didn't do anything to it uh, because it's only one millimeter or so. It, it's not flow limiting, but what we do do is that we, we, we don't put uh, protamine, which uh, we put heparin, which makes the blood flow. It's like, like juice, so it doesn't clot. Uh, and in the, at the end of the operation, we, go, we don't want them to bleed, we put protamine, but in these cases where you see something, you don't put protamine, and then you maybe put a bit more medication post-operatively in order to, to prevent uh, the post-operative thrombosis and stroke here. So that's, that's the value there. And then you want to see the distal anastomosis, that's the, that there's no dissection, no re flow remitting things. And uh, once our surgeons have been starting to do this routinely, Everybody has changed something in the practice. Me too. I abandoned some techniques that I've learned in, in the UK when I was practicing there. Uh, uh, they even published some techniques that I, that I only fi found uh, that are not good because uh, of, of doing these routine ultrasounds. Once the surgery becomes more complex, obviously when you're moving in your career, you do more and more complex surgery. I today am responsible for oncovascular and aortic surgery, which means that we take out tumors that grow into vessels and we do a lot of different bypasses. So these operations can take either a short time or 12, 14 hours or so. And during that surgery, you need to be sure that the organs get the blood. So, so you want to measure flow during, during this surgery. For example, in this uh, benign tumor of a 30-year-old guy of a leiomyosarcoma uh, of the uh, iliac vein, uh, at the end of the operation, we wanted to see that the flow is good. Here you see the inferior vena cava, which looks like uh, the flow in the heart. Uh, you saw these, these curves that looks like low resistant flows. Uh, that's the vena cava, but the flow is a bit different. It's three liters per minute, and, and this goes down to one leg, 1.9 liters a minute. It was a big guy. That's a big flow. Uh, but uh, when you're leaving the operation theater, you need to be certain that there's a good flow and, and the patient is not ischemic in the awakening. Uh, in this oncovascular stuff, we do hepatic surgery uh, or pancreatic surgery together with our pancreatic surgeons, how we solve the, the, uh, some of the reconstructions both in, um, uh, in the transplant region and, and in, in these pancreatic operations. We do these spirals and obviously you want to do an ultrasound and check that everything is good because, you, because after this, when you, they do a viplet, when they do take out the, the, the head of the pancreas, they do a lot of anastomosis for the bile and for the intestine and so forth. So everything is covered. So if you need to go back there and you open the abdomen again, it's, it's, there's no adhesions in the beginning, but, but there's a lot of other stuff that they've done. So you have to uh, be certain before you allow the next guy to do the next anastomosis on that, that everything is okay. So that's why during the operation, it's vital to, to, to check it. Also, in some cases, like this guy in, in trauma, like in, in this guy who, who fell on a construction site and there's an iron bar through his axilla here. Uh, so so not, a, not a nice uh, thing, but actually what we were able to do, because we measured both the flow and the... Um, uh, and, and checked with ultrasound was to, to put a, a syringe on, on that one and then just pull it out and close the wound. Uh, but but we, were, we would not in any other way, well, we could have performed an angiography or something, but, but there was no damage to anything, uh, just taking out the iron bar. Um, so I do believe in science. Uh, I have one more further disclosure to make. Um, in the environment where well, I've been growing, where I've been doing my peripheral vascular surgery, we've been doing all the time TTFM because it was, it was taken into practice in the 80s and 90s before my time. Um, so it's like a parachute to me. But as I do believe in science, I also take this classical study uh, from the British, British Medical Journal where 23 of the 92 uh, uh, people who were... Uh, asked for the study, agreed to jump off an airplane either with or without the parachute, and you could actually see no, uh, no difference in major injury or death. So jumping off the airplane without a parachute is totally uh, safe. They had 92 screened, 69 excluded, 
Finally, 23 were randomized because some of the people thought that it's not a good idea. So 12 jumped with, an, with a parachute and 11 with a control. Uh, three of them could not be contacted, but they were the ones with the parachute uh, and they had a 30-day follow-up. Uh, and so, so we could conclude that jumping off an airplane with or without a parachute is totally similar. It's like operating with or without a TTFM. But there has to be some conditions to that. Thank you very much. <laughs>
uh, where we looked at, at, at uh, um, production technology for advanced products, uh, especially in the medical field. So that was the, that was the um, I mean, the, the, the task from the Norwegian Research Council. Can we bring forth technology that let us uh, have sustainable and, and profitable production of medical devices also in Norway? So out of that, we learned a lot, uh, and, and then we started to look at our own um, production process of existing products. Are we able to put some automation into that and, and make it more or less handmade or labor intensive? So that we are working on, and, uh, but we um, soon realized that, I mean, innovating or, sorry, uh, automating on existing products that was made for I mean, manual uh, assembly 30 years ago is not the ideal situation. So the next step now is to really redesign our product from the inside to um, adapt them for automated assembly. And that is, that is what we are working on. So um, we have a two minute short video uh, showing you a little bit what's going on in our factory in Horten um, as they are today and where we will be tomorrow maybe. As you understood, the last few uh, clips there was from uh, was where we are going. So that's pretty exciting. Another thing that slows us down in, in uh, product development is, of course, the regulatory burden. I mean, uh, we have, um, we have uh, the, the regulatory uh, compliance in the medical device field puts a, a significant burden on, on the organization. Just, um, just the, 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 the amount of external audits through a year drains the organization of, of valuable hours. Also, the design process is, is pretty regulated, uh, making it quite slow. Um, and and, uh, and also, also the certification of the products when they are coming out of, of the product development takes time. And I mean, it can take several years, as Kari showed on the first very few slide here, uh, many years before the release and, and that we have finally reached all, all the markets. So all this puts, puts a burden on us, slows us down, but 
it can also be, I mean, for an established company as medicine, an advantage, as, as it could put some, 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 um, some barriers towards entry of new competition. Um, as everybody knows, innovation is not um, a standalone process that you visit from time to time. It is something that you have to apply all the time and, 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 and take in the mindset in everything you do. So, I mean, often I find myself in the situation where I've been very busy with the next product release and maybe missing a, a, a good customer feedback or, or anything improvements to, to the product because we are, we are too busy like these guys here. So uh, that calls for a, a refined way of working. So um, this is the value chain that we have adhered to for many years. I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's straightforward, but it's quite, it gives quite long uh, development cycles. And, and uh, as the regulatory burden increases, it can also, also slow things down. So what is a refined way of working? Uh, by introducing this yellow proof of concept part gives us um, gives us um, uh, a way of doing a proof of concept with very close uh, feedback to our key customers and stakeholders and knowing what we are going to make before we move that into the more formalized product development uh, helps us keep down costs and hopefully also time to market so um, to fully take advantage of this refined way of working, um, we have uh, established our external innovation team a few years ago, and I'm happy to um, introduce Håkon to tell a little bit more how you work with innovation in medicine. Thank you, Eric. Uh, so the innovation team was established back in 2019, and uh, the main purpose of, of the team is to qualify innovations before uh, putting uh, the idea into a more regulatory uh, perspective. And by uh, establishing this team, uh, Medistim also onboarded new competencies, uh, technical like uh, artificial intelligence and augmented reality, user interface design, uh, and also on the, the um, process side, like rapid prototyping and innovation processes in general. Uh, and then we applied these competencies into our customer dialogue uh, to get a more uh, dynamic uh, relationship to them. And our main objective is obviously to shorten the time to market for the whole product development process. And uh, our innovation mindset. The uh, key thing is that innovation is uh, very rarely uh, just a bright idea falling into someone's mind. It's all about execution uh, and executing on problems. Uh, and we do believe that users know most of their problems, so we need to engage with them and ask them. Uh, but there may be also problems they are unaware of. So we need uh, also to be in the OR and observe their use of uh, our system. So, uh, and then pick uh, problems uh, that they are unaware of. Uh, and uh, then we prioritize the problems. And we start from the top and apply uh, creativity and technology on those problems and create prototypes. And then we go back to the customers and give the prototypes uh, in their hands and uh, observe again. And we do know that uh, our users, they recognize a good solution. They do also recognize a bad solution, believe me. Uh, and uh, if we get more like a so-so uh, feedback, we go back, try again, uh, until we have uh, a good uh, understanding of how good uh, that idea is. So starting in uh, Medistim, the first task I got from Cardi was to formalize uh, Medistim Innovation Network for the cardiac sector. Uh, so Professor Puskas being uh, one of them. Uh, and these uh, uh, cardiac centers all around the world are led by key opinion leaders, also the, the main voices. Uh, and uh, our intention was uh, obviously to share insights uh, across the centers and with us, obviously, and also to go there uh, and uh, get feedback on prototypes. 
Uh, and after that, we continued with uh, vascular uh, also. Uh, Professor Vikatma here representing one, one of them. And, uh, and this Medistim uh, Innovation Network is one of the pillars of our ongoing uh, innovation work. So our current method for innovation uh, is uh, very inspired by, by Google Sprint that uh, some of you may know quite well. So Google Sprint was uh, developed by Google Ventures uh, in evaluating thousands of business ideas. And the beautiful thing about Google Sprint is that you go from mapping a problem uh, to getting a feedback from actual users uh, in one week. Uh, and uh, another beautiful part of it is that it uh, kind of distillates what is good about methods like design thinking and um, uh, agile development uh, in general. Uh, cherry picking are the most usable pieces of those methods for each of the steps here uh, in the process. We do allow ourselves a bit more time than one week when we work with a prototype, as a, when we have the attention of a surgeon. Uh, we want to spend that time really well. So uh, we allow ourselves four weeks so that we are certain that we have a well thought prototype when we actually address uh, surgeons. Then one example, uh, our uh, next generation software uh, that is currently being developed by uh, Eric's team. Uh, so we've been through 13 Google iterations here, traveling uh, the globe with prototypes. Uh, and uh, committed a lot of interviews with clinicians. And to the, down in the left corner, we're in Italy, uh, interviewing a perfusionist, that's a guy uh, operating the heart-lung machine. Uh, and here we have uh, the prototypes. To the right here, we have Professor Taggart from Oxford, giving feedback to our VP of medical. Uh, but uh, as you've heard several times today, uh, Medistem, we are addressing routine use of our products. And um, this simple question here uh, is key, as we need to support uh, understanding what a good flow is if we're going to get to routine use. And if you ask a surgeon, uh, they will say, yeah, um, you need to uh, look at the specific case. So, uh, let's say it's a bypass on the heart, uh, on pump, that means uh, with the support of a heart-lung machine, uh, and using only arteries, no veins, but arteries for graft. Then, what is a good flow? So, US patients, they are very different from Asian patients. So, but if you then limit to just Japan, what is a good flow? And uh, no surprise there, as uh, also within Japan, uh, demographics vary a lot. But with a male, 72 years old, and a BMI of 25, what is a good flow? Again, it depends. And this goes on. Uh, you also have a strategy for the procedure that applies also. So this quite simple question is uh, very complex to address. Uh, so this is our current innovation agenda. Uh, flow integration on top there, as a what is a good flow. Uh, we assess that, and with surgical context, we are able to do that. Same thing for image interpretation, so the ultrasound imaging. Uh, what part of the image is of relevance, and what are the indications in there? With surgical context, we can assess that. The last point there, surgeon control. Uh, the surgeon uh, is sterile, but uh, the miracu, the system, is non-sterile. So there needs to be some um, cooperation for optimal use of the system between a nurse and the surgeon. And that is sometimes complex, uh, like uh, Vikatma demonstrated here with the box, moving the box on the ultrasound image, demands a lot of uh, cooperation. So we want to reduce uh, the dependency of the surgeon to the other clinicians in the room. We can do that by just ease of use. We can do it by uh, automation, like the box, moving the box automatically. Uh, we can also do it by some way of sterile um, 
um, interaction form for the, for, for the surgeon. And uh, please uh, let me remind you that the MediStim systems are in daily use in thousands of ORs. Uh, so uh, we are in a unique position to uh, get access to those data and uh, gain insight of those data uh, to the benefit of uh, MediStim, obviously, but also for the medical industry in general. Thank you. I guess this gives um, at least an, um, uh, a glimpse into what we are thinking about our future for the products and uh, some ideas on how we are approaching innovation also going forward. And also, obviously, we don't want to be too specific about what we have sort of cooking uh, and, and telling about that too soon. Uh, anyhow, we are reaching the end of uh, this meeting today. I hope that you feel that you have a better understanding of the, uh, the company, of the market dynamics that we are operating within, and, uh, and also have a better appreciation for how this company can continue to develop and grow going forward. So my closing remarks here are not many. Uh, I say that the growth will continue. I don't see any reason from what we've heard today that this growth uh, curve should not continue. And uh, from where we are today, uh, we should be able to reach a billion knocks in revenues in a few years. I mean, it took us quite a long time to get where we are today, but it's uh, not far away to reach that billion. And uh, <clears throat> the reason for this is that the markets are growing we heard about cardiovascular disease as a disease area that is continuing to be the, the major uh, problem uh, for, for our society. And we also learned today that the open surgery space is not going away. Uh, on the contrary, it seems that it uh, it's could be expected to continue to grow uh, based on the information that we, we heard today. And this goes for cabbage surgery, this goes for vascular surgery. And of course, then comes also our growth opportunities that I uh, mentioned earlier in the presentation, uh, that we are also working to establish high-frequency ultrasound as this complementary technique together with the flow measurements going forward. And then we will continue to go direct in more countries. So uh, the markets are growing, adoption is growing, competition is sparse, and we are committed to continue to innovate within this field. So with that, I will um, say that, um, yeah, a hidden gem. I, I hope we are not so hidden, at least not for you guys uh, any longer. And then it's uh, a challenge to, of course, get our story more known also in a, in a broader audience. So with that, I, I thank you all for participating today. Thank you. Mm -hmm.